واتل عليهم نبا ابني ادم بالحق اذ قربا قربانا فتقبل من احدهما ولم يتقبل من الاخر قال لا اقتلنك قال انما يتقبل الله من المتقين بسطت إلي يدك لتقتلني ما أنا بباسط ما أنا بباسط يدي إليك لأقتلك إني أخاف الله رب العالمين إني أريد أن تبوء بإسمي وإسمك فتكون من أصحاب النار وذلك جزاء الظالمين فطوعت له نفسه قتل أخيه فقتله فأصبح من الخاسرين فبعث الله غرابا يبحث في الأرض ليريه كيف يواري ليريه كيف يواري سوءة أخيه قال يا ويلتا أن أكون مثل هذا الغراب أعجزت أن أكون مثل هذا الغراب فأواري سوءة أخي فأصبح من النادمين من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا ولقد جاءتهم رسلنا بالبينات ثم كثيرا منهم بعد ذلك في الأرض لمسرفون الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم بفح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم جزاك الله خير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We, inshallah, continue on our studies and reflections on the stories of the Quran and in the last few sessions we have been reflecting on the story of Adam the creation of Adam alayhi salam the story of the first sin of Iblis and the story of the first human sin of Adam السلام, and the descending from the falling from heaven to earth uh, for the human race and one of the things that I would like to review today and elaborate a little bit on something that inshallah we'll, we will see that there is a continuum these lessons that we learn from the first few sessions will repeat themselves there is a direct relation between the sins of Iblis, the ways of Iblis, the tactics of Iblis, and the story of the stories of the Quran in general. The first sin of Iblis, we studied that there are several factors that led to this sin, to, to direct disobedience to the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Iblis. And we studied how there were four, five factors. The first factor was the pride and arrogance, al-kibar. And how any kibar, any arrogance, is walking in the footsteps of Iblis. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly warned us from that. He said, do not follow in the footsteps of Iblis. Do not follow in the footsteps of shaitan. The second factor is the ungratefulness, kufrun nu'mah. The not recognizing the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third factor was al-hasad, envy. How Iblis envied Adam for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon Adam. And he felt 
that he is more worthy of that honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Adam. And he envied Adam and that led to disobedience and that led to sin and that led to the, uh, the falling of Iblis. The fourth, the, the fourth factor was a lack of submission. Direct defiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's orders. Whatever the order is, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do, as long as it is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is to be done. Whether it made sense to us or not, whether it is something that we like or not. And that is called submission, that is called taslim. And that is the essence of Islam. It's to follow the commands and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Iblis did not do that. And the fifth factor was the stubbornness. Being obstinate. Just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ask Iblis and would direct Iblis back and Iblis would, would stay insistent on his disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will see these themes repeating itself in almost every story that we will reflect upon. Because most those who follow in the footsteps of Iblis, they will fall into the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also we studied some of the tactics of Iblis. Some of the things that shaitan uses to make us fall into sin. And one of it is the waswasa, the persistent whispering in the hearts and minds of believers. And then tazyin, the beautification, make things look better, make things look good. Like the tree, the forbidden tree, we saw how Iblis called it the tree of eternity. The tree of eternal kingdom. And Iblis will do that because he said while he's vowing and promising to mislead all humanity, he said, لا لهم في الأرض. I will beautify for them on earth. I will make things that are forbidden for them beautiful, look good, look desirable for them. And that is one of the most Fierce weapons of Iblis, la'anahullah. And then to use the, the human greed, to use the human desires, to use things that are instantly present into our, into our creation and use that to magnify it and use it to control human beings with. So the fear of death that human beings have, Iblis would use that and the desire to live, to live an eternal life, that's how he used, to, that's what he used to bring Adam and Hawa, alayhim as salam, to obey him. And he said, if you eat from this tree, you will, shall never die. This is the tree of eternity. So using those human needs, the human desires, things that you want, Iblis would try to put that as a goal for you to drag you into the misguided path that he wants you to be on. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. And then using scare tactics, using, uh, like we said, our natural fear from poverty, natural fear from death. At least always would remind you that you should never spend your money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you will be poor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that in the Quran, That is the shaitan, he's putting fear in the hearts of those who follow them. Following shaitan lead to more fear and more adherence to, the, to what Iblis offers, and far farther away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last tactic that we used, that we learned, is, is the tactic of deception, of deceiving. And we will see that those themes coming back and again and again in these stories. But it's important to understand this initial story, the initial story of Iblis, the initial story of Adam alayhi salam, because that is a very important story. And that is the, the initial story of the initial sin, the initial forgiveness, the initial repentance. All of that is really magnified and summarized in the story of Iblis and the story later on of Adam alayhi salam. And just few points before we start on today's reflection, inshallah. That when we studied the, uh, when we reflected on the story of Adam alayhi salam, we need to understand there are some, some really uh, important differences between Islamic beliefs, Islamic creed, and especially that of the people of the book, 
because they do have the similar stories in the uh, scriptures that is in the hands of, uh, of the uh, Jews and Christians today, but there are really very important differences. And one of the important differences is uh, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not blame Hawa, does not blame the female for the sin that was committed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ The shaytan deceived them both. The shaytan made them both fall into that sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى And Adam disobeyed his Lord. So it is not to blame the female for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained to mankind. It is, it is both that they fell into the sin, and it is both that they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ رَبَّنَا إِنَّا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا فَاغْفِرْ لَنَا When they repented, they said, Oh Allah, we have transgressed against ourselves. And the speech figure in the Qur'an is clear that it's dual. It's we're both repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other important difference is really the story of struggle. The story of what is life about. And in many... Uh, Thinking, and many thinking of the people of the book, it is a struggle between God and evil. Between good and evil, good being represented by God, and evil being represented by Satan. And in Islamic beliefs, it's important to understand that that's not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala portrays this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all of that. Allah's, Iblis is a servant of Allah, whether he liked it or not. Although he admits to it in the Quran, without any, without any problem. And inni akhafullah, on the tongue of Iblis in the Quran said, I fear Allah. This is not about a fight between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the devil. And the fight is between a human being and the devil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says, اِهْبِطَ مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُو Fall both of you down from it, from heaven. You are enemies to one another. So uh, human beings and the devil Iblis, and those who follow Iblis, are enemies of, of us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوًا فَاتَّخِذُهُ عَدُوًا Shaytan is indeed your enemy, so make an enemy of him. So that is an important point. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then said, there will be guidance that will come to you, and those who follow the guidance, then they shall not fear, and they will be following the right path. And those who reject the guidance that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they, they are the dwellers, and, and uh, the hellfire is their abode. وَالْعِيَادُ billah. The last and, and third important comment that I had for the last few sessions we had, is that first sin that a human being committed, the sin of Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam, there is no sin that, that transferred to all of us. And the Christian believe that every human being is born with, is with the sin of Adam. We are, every human being is born with the burden of that sin that Adam committed. And therefore, there is a need for atonement. There is a need to relieve that sin and that Atonement was achieved by what they claim as the uh, crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam. In Islam it is clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not put the burden of, in, of one sin on anyone else. لا تزر وزرة وزرة أخرى There is no sinner shall carry the burden of another sinner. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yet clearly in the Qur'an said that he's already repentant on Adam alayhi salam. That that sin was forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Adam repented back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ And Adam received words from his Lord and he repented back to his Lord and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the repentance of Adam and Hawa alayhi salam. So that takes us to the next story, the next reflection. And the next story that we inshallah will try to reflect on tonight is one of the most important stories in human history. It is a story where the prediction of the angels was achieved. The malaika, the angels, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I will put a vicegerent on earth. I will put a khalifa on the earth. What did they say? 
Are you going to place there those who will corrupt on earth and shed the blood? And unfortunately, the, the story that we will reflect on is the story of the first bloodshed. The story of the first murder that happened on the face of the earth. And the first crime. And the first crime was about bloodshed. And according to most scholars, the first dead human being on the face of the earth was a murdered person. And the first mechanism of ending anyone's life was a murder. Inshallah, we will study how that happened. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the story. And that is the story of the two sons of Adam. This story is narrated one time in the Quran. This is recited only in one position in the Quran. Like we, when we studied the uh, story of Adam alayhi salam, we see many referrals and at least seven detailed recitations of the story of Adam. But this particular story, it is narrated only one position in the Quran, and that is in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And that is in verses 27 to verse 31. Inshallah, we'll, we'll recite those and we will go into details as much as the time permit trying to reflect on these verses and reflect on that story as it is narrated in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Wa atlu alayhim naba abnay alama bilhaqi id qarraba qurbana. فتقبل من أحدهما ولم يتقبل من الآخر قال لأقتلنك قال إنما يتقبل يتقبل الله من المتقين لئن بسطت إلي يدك لتقتلني ما أنا بباسط يدي يدي إليك لأقتلك إني أخاف الله رب العالمين إني أريد أن تبوء بإثمي وإثمك فتكون من أصحاب النار وذاك وذلك جزاء الظالمين فطوعت له نفسه قتل أخيه فأصبح من الخاسرين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, recite to them the story of the two sons of Adam in truth. When each offered the sacrifice, it was accepted from one, but not from the other. The latter said to the former, I will surely kill you. The former said, verily, Allah accept from those, only from those who are al muttaqun If you do stretch your hand against me to kill me, I shall never stretch my hand against you to kill you. For I fear Allah, the Lord of the world, all that exists. Verily, I intend to let you draw my sin on yourself as well as yours. Then you will be one of the dwellers of the hellfire. And that is the recompense of the wrongdoers. So the nafs, the soul, the self of the other, the latter one, encouraged him and made fair seeming to him the murder of his own brother. He murdered him and became one of the losers. And when you start looking at these verses and analyzing, you see the first, the very first phrase is a very striking phrase. It's something that wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, here I need your attention. And the word is haqq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said, وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأْ أَبْنَيْ آدَمْ إِذْ قَرَّبَا قُرْبَانًا Recite for them, tell them the story of the two sons of Adam as they. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, بالحق. There is a matter of haqq, it's coming here. And al-haqq is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just to translate it as the truth, is really, it's, it's not, doesn't convey the entire meaning of the word. This is about really the ultimate truth, it's about justice, it's about something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to pay close attention to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, recite upon them this, tell them this, because that tells you immediately there are lessons, there are important lessons to learn from these verses, to learn from these stories. So what is the story? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it is the story of the two sons of Adam. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give you the details of who are exactly these two sons of Adam. There are really no, no names, no authentic names, neither in the Quran nor in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we know that the famous two names that is recited when you look at many books of tafsir and many books of uh, Islam, it is Qabil and Habil. And even if you look at the uh, scripture that's in the hands of the people of the book, it's Abel and Cain. 
But truly there is no authentic hadith that tells you the story by the names. Even when the Prophet ﷺ refers to this story, he will say Ibn, Ibn Adam al-Awwal, the son of Adam, the first son of Adam. So the name in particular is not truly mentioned in any books of hadith or in any authentic hadith. And, and it is, and Allahu A'lam, could be Qabil and Habil, could be other things. But like we said, the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not about recitation of facts, it is not about history, it's not about dates, it is the book of guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there is, this is this book, there is no doubt of it, it's guidance. And what is important of any story is not the details, it's not who's the son of who, and the name of the son, the father, the mother, the aunts, it's all about the guidance. It's all about what do you derive out of that story. So there's really no importance to know, and if there is any need to know the names, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have mentioned the names. But just to let you know that when we see, say, the story of Qabil and Habil, most scholars accepted that, most scholars used that, but there's really no evidence, no authentic evidence from the Qur'an or the Sunnah that these are the names of the two sons of Adam. <coughs> From the story, it is uh, derived that they are from the very early generation. And most likely, according to that one hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-awwal, they are really the direct sons of Adam. We are all children of Adam, right? Every human being is a son or a daughter of Adam, alayhi salam. So when you say, Ibn Adam, son of Adam, it could be any, anybody at any time. But this particular story, most scholars accept that these are from the first generation of human beings, the direct children of Adam and Hawa alayhim salam. But again, you will see in some tafasir, some will say they are later on from the people of Israel, from the children of Yaqub alayhi salam. And that is present in the books of tafsir. And there is nothing to contradict this too much. So it is not, again, it's really not that important. But most scholars accept that this is the first generation of human beings. The story goes as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذْ قَرَّبَا قُرْبَانًا فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخَرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarized the story. He said, when each offered a sacrifice, each one of these two children, each one of these two sons of Adam, they offered an offering, they offered the sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One offering was accepted and the other was not. So the details of that, how it happened, what are these offers? A lot of that is again is not known with very authentic transmission. Some scholars and of them, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and uh, Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir narrates a story that this was a competition for to marry a woman. And the habits of the children of Adam alayhi salam, that Hawa would bear twins every time she gave birth. And it's always a male and a female, and it was ordained that that is the family, and each male cannot marry his twin sister, but they can marry a uh, sister of another a twin that was born on a different occasion because all were children of, of Adam and Hawa and, and if all these are brothers and they cannot marry each other then no human beings would exist today. So they had a different criteria. And the story that Ibn Kathir narrates that they compete for that one woman and Hab Habil who is the supposedly the younger son and he is the one that ended up being murdered was rightfully going for the, uh, the, the daughter of Adam that is his halal, that is his, the way that he should be marrying, and Qabil, who is the other brother, was going for his own twin sister, which is not allowable for him. And uh, to Adam, for Adam to uh, solve the problem, he tells them both to give a sacrifice, and whomever the sacrifice is accepted, then he, that person will marry that girl, that daughter of Adam. And of course the sacrifice of Habil was accepted and the sacrifice of Qabil was not accepted and he got mad at his brother and he killed him. 
a lot of Mufassirin would not accept this story. And they will, they said there's really no authentic narration for this. And it, it transforms the whole idea. But for our own purposes, for reflection purposes, this story doesn't become as important. And you will see that. The other story that Ibn Jarir al-Tabari narrates, and he clearly, and this is, he clearly co quote, and this is a direct quotation from the book of Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. And by the way, this quotation is also present in Ibn Kathir, where both Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and Ibn Kathir, they both admit that they got the story from the people before us. So these stories did not come to us from Islamic sources. So again, that's why it's important to understand where these stories come from, and what to accept, and what to accept with that precaution that these great scholars of our ummah put in their tafsir and they put in their books. Ibn Jarir Tabari said, عَنْ بَعْضِ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ بِالْكِتَابِ الْأَوَّلِ I took this from the people of knowledge of the first book. So he doesn't ref reference this to Islamic sources. And the other story that Ibn Jarir narrates that the, uh, the murderer, Qab, which his name was reported as Qabil, Wallahu alam. Uh, was asked to give an offer, and Habil, who is the victim, was also asked to give an offer. And Habil brings, and who was a shepherd, he brings the best sheep he had in his flock. He brings the best he has to offer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Qabil, who is the murderer of this story, bring, he was a farmer. And he brings the things that he doesn't need, he doesn't want, that has no use for him, and that's what he offers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah accepts the sacrifice of Habil and rejects the sacrifice of Qabil. And this particular meaning, the meaning of this, of this particular version of the story is really, uh, it has Islamic authenticity in it, meaning the concept that when you offer whatever charity, whatever you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be the best you have. It has to be something that you desire, your heart desires, and you give up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not something you want to get rid of, and you say, okay, well, here's my sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not something that you don't want, to say, I'll give that to charity. It's the coat that there is just no use for it anymore, and you just can't wear it anymore, and that's what I'm going to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is, and you always give of the things you like, you love, you have to feel that you're sacrificing for this way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah said, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ وَمَا تُنْفِقُوا مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ بِهِ عَلِيمٌ By no means shall you attain righteousness unless you give freely of, what, of that which you love. And whatever you give of a truth, Allah knows it well. And let me just clarify that point a little bit. It doesn't mean that you cannot give things that you have no use of instead of throwing it away. If someone can use it, you should definitely give it to someone who can use it. And if a Muslim needs it, you, can definitely, you should definitely make use of it for your brothers and sisters in Islam. But that should not be the only thing that you would give out. You have to, to give in charity, to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to give of the things that, that are dear to you. For example, money. Money is dear to people. Nobody can say, well, these ten dollars are useless. I mean, you know, or they're, you, know, you give that in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yes, if you have something that you don't use anymore, and you know, you know, you just, instead of just throwing it away, of course you should make use of it. Islam doesn't like waste at all. Allah, the Prophet sallallahu teaches us not to waste anything. Not to waste water, not to waste energy. There is no waste in Islam. Everything, recycling, is an Islamic concept. I'm not going to go into that too much. But Islam doesn't, does not waste. Muslim is, is very nature friendly. Muslim is very society friendly. So, just to clarify that point, we, when we spend in charity, when we intend to sacrifice for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should spend things we like, things we love. Give things, give out and feel that you are sat, that you're contributing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah will accept that charity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it has to be good money, good offering, good charity, and it is not bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا يتتيمم الخبيث من Do not aim that 
which is bad to spend from it. And that just emphasized the point I just said. Don't just limit or just intentionally go to the things that you don't want, that there are bad things in your house, bad things in your money, bad things in your wealth, and say, that's what I'm going to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Given, having said that, there is again no, no evidence that that was what the story was about. And what we do, inshallah, in these sessions, we will depend heavily and reliably on the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And when you go to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and what most of the Mufassireen said, it is simply that they both offered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that offer was accepted from one and was not accepted from the other. And one might ask why? Why was this offer accepted from this brother and was not accepted from that other brother. It is not arbitrary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all just. It is not about favoring one over the other. And it's not about tricking one and slipping that person into sin. And the answer of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from one brother and did not accept from the other brother is present in the same verse. At the very end of that verse, what does the brother tell his other brother? He said, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah accepts, truly accepts from al-muttaqeen. Meaning my offer was accepted because I had what? Taqwa. And your offer was not accepted because he did not have it. It's as simple as that. Now what are the details of this story? Again, that doesn't matter. So it matter, what matters is, is when we offer any deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that deed and that offering, whether it's charity, whether it's something we give, whether it's ibadah, whether it's salah, whether it's zakah, whether anything we do in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be accompanied by taqwa. What is the taqwa that makes our deed accepted and our deeds, if they do not have that, they will not be accepted. That is the important reflection. That is the important message of this ayah. It is not about what are the details of the story, why they had this conflict. The, what is important to hear is the taqwa, the idea of taqwa. is any deeds you have, any offering to Allah that you will offer has to be accompanied by taqwa. And what is this taqwa? Ali ibn Abi Talib was asked about taqwa. He said, define taqwa for us. And he said, At-taqwa hiya al-khawfu min al-jaleel, wal-amalu bil-tanzeel, wal-qana'atu bil-qaleel, wal-istidadu al-yawm al-raheel. He said, there are four things about taqwa. First, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers that they do what they do, they do the good deeds. He said, يُؤْتُونَ مَا أَتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلًا they do the good deeds and their hearts are trembling with fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's when, when someone do, does a good uh, deed and do something good, shouldn't feel like, I've had it nailed. I've done this, now I'm, you know, I'm the best Muslim there is on the face of the earth. Every righteous person that have taqwa, when they do that good deed, they have trembling in their heart. We ask Allah to accept our deed. We ask Allah to give us ikhlas. We ask Allah to give us the sincerity. You always accuse yourself of not being truthful, not being sincere. You have always review ourselves when we do any deeds. To, to not to let the shaitan any, any door slip to come into our heart. Because how does he come into our heart? What is the first sin of shaitan? Arrogance, kibar. So whenever the worshiper, the righteous person, whenever they do something, they always have to, to make sure when they do it, there is no arrogance in that deed. And any good deed has to be accompanied by the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the worst fear that we should have when we do something good is to fear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept that deed for a sin that we have done or something that is not making our offering pure offering. So that is part of the taqwa, al-khawfu min al-jaleel. The second thing, al-amalu bil-tanzeel, to, to, to do, to model our deeds after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the third thing is to be content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Qana'atu bil qaleel. And then the fourth thing, al-istadadu al-yawm al-rahil. Always thinking about the day of judgment. Always preparing for the day of departure from this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the taqwa has to do with total submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Complete submission to Allah. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Do not تُقَدِّمُوا having some argument, having some discussion, having some issues with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet ordains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not do that, have taqwa. Taqwa has to do with the submission also to the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the reason why the sacrifice or the offering was rejected is because it was not accompanied by taqwa. So what happened? What was the response when that offering was rejected? What did he say to his brother? قَالَ لَأَقْتُلَنَّكَ I shall kill you. I will surely kill you. لَأَقْتُلَنَّكَ It's a a form of speech in Arabic when you add the lamb in the beginning and the noon at the end with the tajdeed, with this emphasis, means certainly, you know, you're a dead man. That's what he told his brother. Now we need to analyze that position. We need to reflect on that threat that we know. We all know the story. I mean, the story, it's not, there is no surprise there. But what we're doing here is we need to reflect, we need to understand, we need to avoid the pitfalls that led the son of Adam to be the example of murderers and the leader of murderers in human history. He said, I shall kill you. His brother basically said, I have done nothing that will deserve that you would kill me. Who rejected the offer? Did his brother, the victim brother, did he have anything to do with the rejection of the offer? It had nothing to do. It's completely innocent. So what are the motivations? You know, when you go to analyze a crime, and this is, if you go into criminology, this is a premeditated first degree murder. Because you see that there is a predetermination. After the intention was clearly declared, by this brother, he said, لَأَقْتُلَنَّكْ I shall truly kill you. I shall surely kill you. There is predetermined, there is premeditated murder. You know, murders, there's the first degree and the uh, second degree murder and involuntary manslaughter. Even in Islam, there are differences between the types of killing. There is al-amad. Al-amad basically is a premeditated murder. And there is shibh al-amad, that is doing something that is harmful, that you may lead to death, but there is no intention of killing. But that action led to death. And there is khata. There is, you know, something that is just had no intention of killing. The act itself may not lead to kill, usually to death, but it happened. And that is called qatl al-khata. But this is murder of the worst type. There is no doubt about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will show us that. Only four verses, subhanAllah. And I know I don't have time to go over them. I know that. It's only four verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put so much lessons and so much, so much uh, uh, things to learn from these verses, subhanAllah. So he said, لَأَقْتُلَنَّكْ What are the things that caused them to do that? Now remember what we talked about in the beginning here. We were talking about the footsteps of Iblis. The things that led shaitan to his disobedience, to his sin, you will see these things playing each, the same theme again and again. And every major disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First thing that happened, envy. Iblis had envy against Adam. Because Allah honored Adam. And he felt that he is worthy of that honor. And he wished ill to Adam. He said, Ana khayru min, I'm better than him. How come he is the one that the angels are prostrating and I should prostrate to him? So he had envy against Adam. And the same thing that the murderer in this story had envy against the victim. How would Allah accept your offering and not accept mine? So he was envious. What is envy? 
Envy is feeling, feeling hatred and bitterness towards another, and that other person has some bounty, some gift. And the hasid, the one that, that is doing that act of envy, the envious, the, the person that is envying, the envying person wishes that that gift should be completely gone from that person. So, just an example, if, if someone envies another, inshallah there will be no envy among Muslims. We inshallah always have to recite those verses that, that turn away envy in our hearts towards others and from others towards us. So when we go into something that our wealth, something that is a bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us with our children, people, health, whatever it is, we say, MashaAllah, la quwwata illa billah. MashaAllah, la quwwata illa billah. That is taught in Surah Al-Kahf. And that, inshallah, will protect what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And it's an admittance that it is only given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to repel hasad, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقُ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبُ وَمِنْ شَرِّ يَنْفَثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ وَمِنْ شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ Mu'awwadhat, to say to, to recite the mu'awwadhat, protect insha'Allah against hasad. But that is hasad, and that is a very serious disease. That is an extremely serious disease. Don't take that as the evil eye, it's a myth, you know, you put this, it is very serious illness that afflicts the heart. And it turns the heart into an evil heart. And we always have to be watchful. And I'm not saying watchful of others against us. We have to always, the Muslim always accuses himself or herself first. We have to watch our heart not to be afflicted by that illness. The illness of al-hasad is a very serious one. And many books have been written about hasad. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ لِلْرِجَالِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا اكْتَسَبُوا وَلِلْنِسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ مِمَّا اكْتَسَبُوا وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا In Surah An-Nisa verse 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not wish, do not desire what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored some of you over others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that desire in people's hearts. But Allah said, I ha Allah has given each and every one of us different gifts, different things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us into accountability according to what He has given us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not have these desires in your heart for what I have favored some of you over others. Men has a share of what they have been given and what they have acquired, and women have their certain already predetermined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala share for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. So men should not envy women, women should not envy men, men should not envy each other, and women should not be envious of each other. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you want what, what you, if you desire something, وَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Don't envy the other person, don't look at what the other person has. Just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Min fadli. Ask Allah from His bounty, from His gift, and Allah shall bestow bounties upon you. Inna Allah kana bi kulli shay'in alima. And here it's very beautiful ending of this verse. And I'm digressing a little bit. But really hasad is a very important thing that we should have to think about a lot. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he's finishing this verse, you might think Allah would have said, Inna Allah kana karima. Allah is all generous, Allah will give you. Ask Allah, Allah will give you, right? But Allah didn't say that in the ending of that verse, 32 of Nisa. He said, Allah is all knowledgeable of all things. Why is that? Allah gives you what he knows is better for you. Allah knows better than you do what is better for you. And leave it to the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give you what he thinks is the best for you in this dunya, in this temporary world that he planted you in for a test. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah makes some people wealthy, but if they had been poor, it would have been bad for them. They would have gone into ways of haram. And to, so Allah for that, he would give them wealth. And that would be better for them. And Allah would make people poor. And that would be better for them. How come? Well, some wealthy people, they go and spend their wealth, 
and haram things and they transgress upon others and they have pride and they have arrogance and they do things that are not allowable. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for them, He deprives them from that well. So, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا Allah gives each and every one according to His wisdom and to His knowledge. Yes, ask Allah. But always thank Allah for what He has given you. And in Sahih Muslim, in the Sahih of Muslim, the Prophet wasallam said in this beautiful hadith, narrated on the authority of Abu Huraira. He said, the Prophet wasallam, and I wish, you know, I, I wish my heart can always apply that. And I wish that for all my brothers and sisters. Prophet وسلم, said, انظروا إلى من أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم فهو أجدر أن لا تزدر نعمة الله عليكم The Prophet said, always look to the people that they are a little bit lower than you in status. Whether it's wealth, whether it's health, and any bounty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us different bounties of different things. Sometimes if you just look at the people that would have been deprived from this. I mean, you have two legs to walk on, right? And how many of us have always get up in the morning and say, Alhamdulillah, I just cannot thank Allah enough for these two legs. When do you always see that? It's if you see some double amputee. That's when you really think about that bounty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Allah gave us hearing, Allah gave us sight, Allah gave us health. And even the wealth, and some people may get a little bit tired, said, you know, I just can't buy this new car, and I, I'm just not doing too well. But just think about the billions of people that don't have anything to, you know, but their feet. To, and some people, they don't even have that, which we just mentioned. So the Prophet said, always look at those who are a little bit less, they are more deprived than you in any certain wealth. So you can appreciate the ni'mah. So you can appreciate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And the examples are really limitless. But we always have to appreciate every time you feel like things are a little tight. You're either a little more sick, there is some affliction, there is some problems. Always think about who doesn't have the things that you have. And that really just makes, you, makes all of us appreciate the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, the, the water. You know, we live in a country, alhamdulillah, you just open a tap and a pure, clear water comes out. And, and you, you turn the tap, one thing it's cold and the other it's warm. You have soap, you have water, you take showers. I mean, do you know what is the percentage of people on the face of the earth below poverty level? The majority of people that live on the face of the earth are below poverty. The majority of human beings do not have sources for clean water. And we should appreciate the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu said, always think of those who are lower in you, than you. Don't look up, don't look at the yachts and the palaces and say, I'm just not doing well at all. That's, the Prophet teaches us different ways. He said, don't do that. Appreciate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the shakur. Allah loves those who have gratitude towards Him. And they appreciate the ni'mah. And that's what preserve the ni'mah, the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah said, only few of my servants do that. وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ Very few of my servants that actually do that and appreciate that ni'mah. And the Prophet ﷺ warned against hasad. He said in the famous hadith in Al-Bukhari, and that hadith, takes multiple sessions to just go through. But the Prophet ﷺ is teaching the Muslims manners. And this beautiful hadith, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالظَّنِّ فَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ أَكْذَبَ الْحَدِيثِ لَا تَحَسَّسُوا وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا تَنَاجَشُوا وَلَا تَحَاسَدُوا وَلَا تَضَاغَضُوا وَلَا تَدَابَرُوا وَكُنُوا عِبَادُ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا This hadith just summarizes how to have relationship between Muslim brothers. And inshallah, the chance may come and, and we will go over that. But part of that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, do not be envious of one another. Don't look at what the other person has. Don't look at what your brother has, what your sister had. What the, what, just look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And if you want more, ask Allah from His bounty. But don't be envious of one another. And that's just one of the things that the things that led Iblis to his disobedience, 
and led the son of Adam to his, to his sin, to the capital sin that he committed against his own brother, when he envied his own brother. Envy brings hatred in the heart towards the person that is being envied. And the murder became easy like we saw. He, it was easy for him later on to kill his own brother because of envy. So beware of envy. The other problem, and again following right into the footsteps of Iblis, is the lack of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What it would have been more proper for him to do or to say? It is Allah that rejected his offering, right? What would have been more proper? It's to review himself, to say, why, why was my offer rejected? Why was my offer rejected? His brother told him though, he said, Allah accept from the pious people. So his brother was trying to help him, the victim brother was trying to help him to find his way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of him accepting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take that as a warning sign, and work to, her, to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he just took it with anger towards his brother. He reflected anger towards his brother. And that is just again from the shaitan. When the shaitan disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he didn't take responsibility, he didn't review his own actions. He, say, he said to Allah, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي The way you, you led me into deception, I will lead them all into misguidance. And here the same concept. Instead of taking responsibility and reviewing his own action, he projected blame against who? Against his brother. His brother, did, his brother did nothing. His brother did nothing that would cause his offering to be rejected. It was his own deeds that made his offering rejected. But yet he would not accept that responsibility. Again following in the footsteps of shaitan. That's why I repeat myself and I say that first story is extremely important. The third thing is pride, arrogance. Again, the footsteps of shaitan. How would Allah accept your offering and not mine? I'll kill you. There is no better person that's going to walk the face of the earth who's better than me. So if I kill you, I'll become the better person that is living there. He had arrogance. He was... He was Tyrant. He's transgressing against his own brother. And he started comparing like Iblis, like Shaitan started comparing. I'm what, what, why me, not him? Why him, not me? Start comparing these two positions and not leaving that up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah bestowed upon one person, or one servant, it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's issues. And it's only the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what was the response of the victim? And we will see the response of this pious brother. The first thing he did is he told his brother the way back. He's telling his brother, you want your offering to be accepted? Ittaqillah. Have taqwa. إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ So, because when we go through these responses of the brother, the victim brother, you can't start from the end, because it went through stages. This was a premeditated murder that took a lot of back and forth discussion, and, and this, this position taken by both brothers. So, you have to take, take it at, with strides, one at a time. The first response of the victim brother, victimized poor brother, he told his brother, you know what? Ittaqillah. He gave him advice. And the Prophet وسلم, in hadith that we will inshallah say a little bit more later, he recommends for people to be like the victim. He said, be like this person. If you have the choose, what, which role you're going to play in life, take this role. Although he was a victim, the Prophet ﷺ said, do what he did. And the first thing he did is he gave nasiha. He gave advice to his brother. And his brother is, was not worthy of his advice, did not take his advice, but the, one, the victim is worthy of giving advice. Rasulullah ﷺ said, Ad nasiha. religion is all about nasiha, it's about advice. 
And they said to who, Ya Rasulullah? Qala lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li khasati al-mu'minin wa ammatihim. He said, for Allah, for his prophet, and for the, the leaders of the believers, and for the general believer. You give advice to everyone. You give advice, meaning advice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's again a hadith that needs more explanation, is by following the advice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the advice of his prophet, and then taking that and spread it among people, and advise the leadership, and, among, and then advise the, your family, and the deen is all about tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Recommend to each other, remind each other with haq and remind each other with sabr. And here's what this brother is doing. First is giving advice back to his brother. He said, have taqwa, ittaqillah. Reminders. That's the first reaction of that good brother. And then he said something that is extremely beautiful and important. And there's a lot of debate generated and a lot of discussion generated from this particular phrase in Islamic history. He said, لَإِن بَسَطَّ إِلَيَّ يَدَكَ لِتَقْتُلَنِي مَا أَنَا بِبَاسِطٍ يَدِيَ إِلَيْكَ لِأَقْتُلَكَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ If you do stretch your hand against me to kill me, I shall never stretch my hand against you to kill you, for I fear Allah. So here is, he is adhering, he said, you want to swerve from the right path of Allah, I'm staying on the path of Allah. If you do wrong, whatever it takes, even if it, if it cost me my life, I'm going to stick to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do. He said, you, even if you kill me, I will not kill you. At the next session, inshallah, we'll go a bit more detail about what that exactly means. It's not against self-defense. It has special circumstances. And it has a special meaning for this particular verse. Have to remember, it's the brother against brother. And the last thing he said, he gave him the clear warning. The last verse. So you see, it went through phrases. And if you read it from the end, you might think he's really trying to get his brother to hell. He's not. He said, إِنِّي أُرِيدُ أَن تَبُوءَ بِإِثْمِي وَإِثْمِكَ فَتَكُونَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّارِ وَذَٰلِكَ جَزَاءُ الظَّالِمِينَ He's given him the very final and last warning. But that before that, he gave him a reminder. And he told him the enormity of the killing. He said, because this sin is so ugly, and this crime is so enormous, that even if you are coming to do it against me, I will not engage in that crime against you. And then the last thing is he reminded him, in a final way, when it is time to commit that crime, he said that you, if you do that, you will be of the dwellers of the hellfire. Verily, I intend to let you draw my sin onto yourself, the sin of murder, as well as yours, as the sin that led you to be rejected from Allah. He, has, he said, if you kill me, not only you will have the sins that led your offering to be rejected, whatever you have done before that led to the rejection of your offer, you will add the sin of killing me. You will add an enormity to that, and then you will end up in the hellfire. وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ الظَّالِمِينَ So he had three stages of response. And of that, the adherence to, the, to the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command is the most important message here. When he told his brother, he said, لَئِنْ بَسَطَّ لَئِنْ بَسَطَّ إِلَيَّ يَدَكَ لِتَقْتُلَنِي مَا أَنَا بِبَاسَةٍ يَدِيَ إِلَيَّ كِلَا أَقْتُلَكُ When you stretch your hand on to me to kill me, I will not do that against you. I indeed fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will adhere to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recommended no matter what. And he said, this killing, this murder is so enormous that I will not accept it against myself. I will not accept my soul to do it even if it means that I'm killed. And the... the Interpreters of the Qur'an and the interpreters of the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had two different opinions about that. The first opinion they said, that killing, any killing, for whatever reason, whatever reason there is, was haram, completely forbidden, even in self-defense. Because of that early community, the preservation, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains as a sharia, as a law, as whatever is... is, is uh, recommended for that first family of human beings is no killing is absolutely allowed no matter what. 
And this was the first murder ever. So according to some scholars, that even self-defense was not allowed. Any type of killing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not meant for people to kill each other. For human beings to shed blood. And any killing was haram. And then later on, it was allowed. Self-defense was allowed. And they draw some examples like, the Muslims in Mecca were not allowed to carry weapons. They were not allowed to fight. They were not al although they were being attacked, some of them were being killed, many of them were being tortured, but not, they were not allowed to carry weapons. They were not allowed to take arms. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his own wisdom for that. The second opinion, and uh, it seems like we have to, to leave the second opinion till next time, because we're, we're a little bit out of time. But inshallah, we will go back to this particular subject, and it's a very important subject. We're talking about the most heinous crime that any human being can commit against a human being. And the unfortunate and the sad thing that this heinous crime that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recites the story for us particularly so we can be aware of the enormity and the seriousness of it is being committed in, in, in a very unrestrained way and it's so common like we remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that some of the signs of the day of judgment is there will be too much killing that even the victim doesn't know why he was or she was killed, and the murderer doesn't know why he is killing. And we see, subhanAllah, some of that. We see so much killing that sometimes our senses is becoming desensitized to that. And inshallah, we will stop here, and in the next session we will restart again with the meaning of murder and the enormity of this capital sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned human being against. قولوا قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فيا فوز المستغفرين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين. I think we have some time for questions and comments. We have what, 15 minutes? Brother Mansour. Maalikum salam wa الله. Right. The, the question is, what was the sign that this particular sacrifice was accepted and that other sacrifice was not accepted? According to most, most scholars, that, uh, and it is in the Quran actually, from the people of Israel, that the people before us, when they would offer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they put their offer on an altar. And a fire would come and eat the, the offering that is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the things that are not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be consumed by that fire. And what happened is fire consumed the sacrifice of the victim brother and did not consume the sacrifice of the uh, murderer brother. So uh, according to most scholars, that's what, what happened. It was a clear sign that this is accepted and that's not accepted. And the, the, uh, one of the things that the people of the book challenged the Prophet wasallam. They said, if you're truly a prophet, bring a sacrifice that would be eating and consumed by fire. And it's in the Quran. You said, the Qurban and Akuluhun Niran. Show us something that the fire will consume. And the Prophet وسلم, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, responded to them that that's, that's uh, over. It's a different, uh, different time. Yes, uh, and then Jalal. Very important message, Jazakallah, Brother Zaman. I can't repeat everything you said, but basically, Brother Zaman, he said he attending, attended a program that was basically Catholic, Protestants, and Jews, and they were trying to reflect on that particular story as it's narrated in the Gospel and in the Torah. And they were spending hours trying to extrapolate meanings, and, and they couldn't really get come up with anything that is significant after a long discussion, and they were scholars in, in those uh, sects and religion. And he said, SubhanAllah, you see when you look at the Qur'an, although the, the Bible, for example, will, will tell you the names, like I said, and the names are not here. There is no more details in there than there is here. Actually, the Qur'an is so filled with wisdom and guidance. And you can see every word you can analyze. And, and I, you know, I'm really just not any 
uh, no knowledge whatsoever. And I'm sure most uh, scholars would come up with hours upon hours upon books of, of the wisdom and the lessons that could be extrapolated and extracted from these verses. The other thing is we have to really not only take those and, and reflect on them as a story. We have to reflect as, like I said, the Prophet ﷺ said, behave like the son of Adam. Behave like that victim. So how many of us respond that way, understand that way, and go over what, what, the, you know, the, what the, the victim said the, to give advice, not to react by, for a threat. He said, you'll kill me, I'll kill you, and kill your father and mother and your dog. You know, just, th this is not, th and this is what, how human beings are working today. today. You, you attack me with a bullet, I'll throw a nuclear bomb over your house. You know, I mean, people, and Muslims among, amongst each other. I mean, I'm not, we're not talking about only Muslims, non-Muslims, international conflicts. Humanity has lost track of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to go. And we have, there is no other way but to reflect back on the book, the only book of guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to mankind. I didn't paraphrase it all well, but Zakallah, Jalal. Right. Well, it depends on what the question. Let me repeat the question. Is you know, and it, this will come again and again in many of these stories because there will be some details that are not in the uh, in the Quran. But some people will will say no. But I know this is what happened to the woman of Lut. She turned into, for example, a, a, a salt uh, column, whatever. But and, and and the name of these people are very well known. It's Qabil and Habil. But the so Brother Jalai is saying, usually the things that are not in the Qur'an, that are not in the Sunnah, they're really not necessary. They're not necessary for the understanding of the story. They're not necessary to take the lessons and the ibrah from these stories. So what is the opinion of the scholars about complementing these stories, you know, adding the names and adding some events that were not narrated in the Qur'an from the Israeliyat, from the books and the Gospels and the people before us? And there is, again, difference of opinion on that. Ibn Kathir. Yes, Han, you want to say something? Okay, well, I will do that next. Yeah. Ibn Kathir, in the beginning of Al Bidaya and Nihayan, in the beginning of in his introduction, his preface to Qasas uh, al uh, Anbiya, and I'm, I'm, I forget exactly where he put the, but there is one hadith that he said, when the Prophet ﷺ said, حدثوا عن بني إسرائيل ولا حرج Bring on the stories of the people of Israel ولا حرج There is no problem with that. And he said, then you take, you have to go into the authenticity of these stories from the uh, Ahbar, and Ibn Abbas used them, and many of the Sahaba l learned those from their contact of the, with the people of, of uh, Israel in Medina, and some of the Jews, that became Muslims, like Ka'b al-Ahbar and, and other, and they were just scholarly Jew, Jewish uh, rabbis that turned into Islam. They brought some of the details into the Muslim uh, tradition. And that's how it finds its way to Ibn Jarir and Ibn Kathir. This is the, the source of these things. Now you have other, you have modern uh, Mufassirin and other Mufassirin that say, for example, if you read Fi Dilal al-Quran, uh, Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah will not, he will say, we don't know the time, we don't know the name, and we'll just go think about the, to extrapolate the wisdom out of it. And there is no need to use any of that. So there is, there is conflict, there is, and the re only reason I mentioned uh, the stories is because it is narrated by big scholars in our tradition, like Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and Ibn Kathir al-Dimashqi. And you cannot ignore that. And, but you have, like they did, to tell the source. And like they did, and, and I took liberty to say that what, that particular story is not going to add to what I'm going to reflect upon. I'm, I, my, what my reflections, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened for me, has nothing to do with those stories. I mean, whether the, the conflict was over a woman or over a sheep or over a field, doesn't matter. It has to do clearly, like Allah said, with taqwa. You didn't have taqwa, Allah did not accept from you. Whatever it is, whether it's uh, defying 
the tradition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to, to the children of Adam, to the first generation, or it is uh, offering things that are not befitting to be offered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's lack of taqwa. Whatever it is, it's lack of taqwa. So in my opinion, it's better to speak about that. But Allahu a'lam. Does that answer? Yes, yeah, Sheikh Masoud, comment. Uh, it's a very important comment just for the people online. Sheikh Masoud, uh, he's our imam here in the masjid. Uh, he said that the, the, the taking from the people of Israel was not uh, without any uh, guidelines. These great scholars, like when we say Ibn Abbas and others, when they took from the people of Israel, there were certain conditions. One of it was, uh, most important one, there is no contradiction with the hadith, uh, the sunnah, or any contradiction with the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you hear uh, there is a conflict between the story that is written in the Bible or in the Torah and what is recited in the Quran, there is no doubt we cannot take from that. We cannot take from the people of Israel. The other thing, there is certain information that does not contradict and we will not reject it nor we would take it as part of our Islamic tradition. We would just stay silent. And he said part of that just like the names of Qabil and Habil. That came to us from the people of the book, Abel and, and Cain. We, we don't reject that. We don't know if it's wrong. We don't know if it's true. We just take it as it is. Wallahu alam. Just a summary of what he said. What was the question online? The question from Sister uh, Adam. No. Right. The question is about self-defense and whether a majority of the scholars say self-defense is okay. Self-defense to protect your life, to protect your wealth, to protect your honor is uh, by my, not the majority of the scholar unanimously, by all the scholar is allowable in Islam to protect the protection of your, of your family, the protection of your wealth and the protection of your life. But we will talk about that a little bit in more detail next session. What is what, when the Prophet ﷺ recommends in certain situation to not even take up arms even if a war is going around you and you feel like if you take up arms you might be protecting your family, it's specific in the types of fitna. When there is a fitna among Muslims, when there is a Muslim killing another Muslim, to really not to reincinerate, not to add to this fitna, then the Prophet ﷺ in one hadith to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he said, just lock your house and stay in there. He said, what if they come to me and they get into my house to kill me? He said, be like the son of Adam, the victim. So the Prophet ﷺ said, in certain situations, when it becomes Muslims are slaughtering other Muslims, it's just better not to do anything. Although most scholars you know, would say self-defense in some of these situations as well, is allowable, but not to fight is better. But to fight, to protect your house, to protect your family, to protect your honor, to protect your life, there is no doubt that that is allowable. Wallahu alam. Talk about that. The, the uh, Sheikh Ilahi said the example is, is Uthman ibn Affan and the scholars in, in, actually when you read the tafsir of these verses they said the first person in Islam that took up the position was Uthman ibn Affan Uthman ibn Affan said no killing for my life if I am to be killed I am to be killed and they can come to my house and they can kill me but there will be no arms to defend my life so he will not let the sahaba kill those who were surrounding or fight those who were surrounding his house. You don't think that you know, Ali al-Hassan and Hussein, Abdullah ibn Zubair were, they were all the greatest fighters in our Islamic history, yet they, could not, they didn't do anything because Uthman insisted that that is the position he will take. There will be no bloodshed for his life. If it's because it's a fitna, because those who are standing outside are Muslims, and those inside are Muslims, and they will fight each other, Muslims will be killing Muslims. So he said, whatever happens at the end, there will be no bloodshed. And his life was sacrificed, and he was, according to most scholars, the Islamic, the Islamic example of this particular position. I guess we have to conclude, inshallah, because of Salat al-Isha. Jazakumullah khair for your attention, inshallah. And inshallah, we will continue next weekend.